Um, keeping with the theme of, um, of shelter and settlements and how we interact together as CCCM in these informal sites, um, it is a real pleasure for me to introduce, uh, not that he needs any introduction, but um, Chuck Stetchel. And uh, many of you know Chuck because he's been the Senior Settlements and Shelter Advisor at USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance for over the last 40 years. He has so much domestic and international experience in um, helping us to kind of reflect on ways in which designing and managing shelter and settlements projects can be better. He also has expertise in disaster risk reduction um, from many, many countries. He's been involved in almost every major international disaster and crisis response um, with OFDA and now BHA. Um, and when he's not responding to disasters or reviewing proposals, Chuck is involved in funding and designing projects, including the Global Shelter Cluster publication, the Shelter Settle, the, excuse me, the Settlements Approach Guidance Note, and the recent Interaction Shelter and Settlements Working Group paper, Roadmap to Research, so Chuck, I know you're gonna talk us through updates from the new BHA. We're all getting accustomed to calling it BHA. So I wonder if you can share with us your presentation or great. Uh, do you see it? We do, yes. Great, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, thanks for that, Liz, really appreciate it. Um, I think it's, uh, a real opportunity for us, and it's it's an unusual opportunity for us to to uh, uh, engage with the CCCM cluster. We we don't do it enough, uh, to be honest. Um, we have historically, I think, um, through OFDA, been focused on um, IDPs, which has been more the uh, focus of our activity. Our counterpart office at the State Department. Office of Population, Refugees, and Migration has been focused on refugees over time. Um, and so um, our engagement now with, with CCCM is uh, increasing, um, uh, I think, by the day. And uh, we can talk about that for a second here. Um, the new USAID, Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, it's a, it's a quick update for you. Um, our, our mission, uh, you know, after 56 years as OFDA, um, our mission has expanded a bit. Um, we are now more focused, um, as we were before, on saving lives and uh, alleviating uh, uh, suffering and reducing the impact of disasters. And now we're really trying to focus more on, on uh, people becoming more self-reliant. Uh, that is going to be a much more explicit objective of activities. Again, we were created last year um, merging uh, USAID's offices of Food for Peace with the U.S. Office for Foreign Disaster Assistance. Uh, so we have food aid and non-food aid uh, uh, now under one, literally under one bureau. Um, all other bureaus' uh, offices have been uh, kind of have migrated to other parts of the agency. They still exist, but uh, these two key offices of humanitarian assistance are now under one umbrella. And with a new agency, actually, a new bureau, uh, we have a new team. Um, we, uh, as you know, for many years, uh, there were two or three of us um, working uh, exclusively on shelter and settlements. We, we now have 10. Um, we are going to expand to 13 or 14 in the next year or so. You'll note that we have engineers and uh, medical doctors and urban planners uh, um, and architects and uh, and settlements planners. So uh, a wide range. Uh, we're getting a legal officer uh, soon to focus on uh, HLP issues. Um, and we've actually increased the number of awards managers and program assistants, primarily because 
um, our budget now this year will probably be to support shelter and settlements activities uh, ending uh, our fiscal year and September 30th, we will probably exceed a quarter of a billion dollars in terms of assistance for shelter and settlements. Uh, that's a 25 or 30% increase over a couple of years ago. So we're expanding. Communication and outreach as well. Um, you may know that we uh, issued some new emergency guidelines uh, that this year, uh, they will be in effect for one more year. Um, we will start, we've already started the uh, revision process. Uh, any comments or uh, interests that you may have, please convey uh, to us. Uh, we're uh, quite receptive to changing guidelines where it seems appropriate. We have for a number of years provided uh, annual sector updates. Uh, we will continue that. Um, we started recently a newsletter, a quarterly newsletter. We hope to uh, issue uh, externally to the agency. Um, right now, it's kind of in-house um, education and awareness raising. Um, many of our colleagues, for example, in the, uh, in the Office of uh, Food for Peace have, have never really been involved in shelter activities. So it's, we have a, a, a brand new internal audience that we need to work with as well. Uh, World Habitat Day last year, um, I wrote a piece on uh, a 10 years on review of some work that we did in Haiti after the earthquake, um, uh, showing the, the uh, feasibility and impact of uh, transitional shelter and settlements activities and how they have evolved over the 10 year period, um, actually a very positive development. Uh, common comments. Some of you may recall something that I put together in 2017. We are now putting a new, I think uh, it's out this week or next, uh, something called common comments. These are uh, comments that we typically provide as feedback for those who submit funding proposals. And it's a compilation of kind of the most common comments so that if you have a copy of it, um, hopefully it will inform uh, proposal writing, project design going forward. Um, we'll try to get that posted in the next week or so. We're also going to move into a new uh, arena for us, uh, uh, specific um, guidance papers or guidance notes uh, on, on specific issues. Uh, these will be one and two page uh, resource documents to, uh, to highlight some of, the, some of the key issues that we think uh, need a little bit of, of uh, focus. Some of the issues and challenges that we have, uh, we have, as some of you well know, uh, been very, very concerned and have been uh, uh, increasingly vocal of late with the regard to kind of global coverage of shelter and settlements needs. Um, the latest uh, global shelter cluster dashboard on the webpage suggests that we have a very, very low percentage of, of identified needs actually covered covered with uh, shelter assistance. So we really need to raise the rate of, of coverage. This is, uh, uh, when I say very low, it's very low. It's less than 10% uh, globally. Uh, so it, it's uh, obviously there are issues with data and collection and methodology and definitions, and what have you. But I think people generally know that it's a fairly low percentage. So a few ways that we can do that to raise the rate is obviously we need to uh, focus on at least providing uh, uh, the, the basic sphere guidance. And, and that provides us with a benchmark as a donor uh, to provide assistance that, that would be considered uh, appropriate and acceptable and adequate, minimally adequate. And it also gives us as a donor, um, essentially an inoculation against those who would like to um, see a, a much more robust um, responses um, into the uh, reconstruction arena development arena. It's something that we are not mandated to do and it's not something that we that we really particularly, I think, given our capacities and the capacities of most humanitarian actors are really not uh, possible to do. Um, plastic sheeting is a shelter input and not 
an NFI item. I'm, I'm sure that many of you have heard this before. For me, it's, it's fine to combine uh, inputs as a part of distributions, but really uh, once the plastic sheeting arrives on scene uh, and is uh, uh, incorporated into a program, it needs to be programmed. It needs to uh, have the uh, technical uh, insights and guidance that uh, uh, humanitarian actors can provide. One of the problems that we've seen in many places is that, that even plastic sheeting is not fixed well. Um, even the basics of emergency shelter are not done well. So we need to raise the bar of quality. And, and I think the previous session really focused uh, on that theme um, uh, to a very large extent. Uh, paint and plaster. Um, I, I know it seems like diving into minutia but we really need to limit uh, the, the expenditures that we uh, provide for paint and plaster. And we're starting, as many of you know, to really cut back on this. Um, the, the, the focus instead needs to be on these larger issues, uh, one of them being coverage. Um, it's nice to think that we can um, provide uh, a bit of paint and a bit of plaster, and that's fine and, and that's acceptable. But we're not, um, we receive proposals on a regular basis where people are proposing six coats of paint and four coats of plaster. Um, these are, these are uh, excessive. Uh, and I think most people would agree that they are. Um, the um, Shelter and Settlements Humanitarian Assistance and USAID's mandate, as, as, uh, as you know, we're focused on humanitarian assistance. We want to get uh, people um, help people establish a platform for response and recovery that uh, uh, takes place at both the shelter and the settlements level. Uh, we want to help inform the nexus point um, between humanitarian assistance and reconstruction and development assistance. Um, I like to think of it in terms of a nexus phase. Um, it's the, the precision of identifying a point might be just a little bit beyond all of us, but uh, a nexus phase is something that we really need to be thinking of. And opportunities um, with this new mandate and new uh, staffing, new uh, resources, a new focus really at, at USAID writ large with our new director and, um, and senior management. Um, our mandate is broader now. And the out of camp policies of the uh, CCCM uh, cluster that emerged in uh, 2013, 2014, uh, it really enables our engagement, a greater engagement. It's, um, as, as I said before, the heretofore many of the camp activities were focused on refugees. And, and we have not by um, uh, arrangement with our colleagues at the State Department been able to actively engage in that. It, as you know, um, there was a discussion in the last session of Bangladesh and the, and the camps, uh, the Ringa camps. Um, we have been able to uh, be involved um, on DRR and, and climate change issues, um, not directly uh, in shelter to the degree that we want to. Um, so that's an example of this division that we hope um, will be breaking down and that we can be more engaged in, in the activities of the CCCM cluster. And along with uh, DRR and climate change activities, uh, a greater focus on urban. Uh, you know better than most that um, most um, displaced um, uh, people are now living in urban spaces. They're not living in camps. And this will, this trend will likely continue. Um, this is something that we think is uh, really very significant and has profound uh, implications for programming and, and strategy going forward. And a greater context, uh, focus on context, context, context. You probably heard me say that a lot too. Um, and it's really important. Uh, Localization is really important. Um, focusing on local markets to help them recover labor and materials, uh, very, very important. Um, the, the, um, uh, the shelter uh, sector probably has a, uh, investments in locally designed, local, locally sourced, um, local labor uh, content in shelters probably higher than any other humanitarian sector. 
um, the economic benefits can be fairly profound. Um, and, and I think we need to all uh, focus on this idea of localization and getting um, all uh, uh, affected communities involved uh, in, in, in the work of humanitarian response. And informing this um, will be a, a greater focus on the settlements approach. And then uh, at, the, at that kind of suburban level, um, the neighborhood approach, um, very similar uh, scale uh, issue, but the settlements approach of really trying to, to integrate um, in a, in a multi-sector way, um, uh, humanitarian assistance in, in socially defined spaces so that we are more effective, more efficient, um, hopefully uh, uh, much more useful as humanitarian actors. And looking ahead, um, as a part of a recent engagement with the Global Shelter Cluster, um, we requested the reactivation of the donor consultation group. And we, I think uh, we would like to do the same thing. Perhaps we can have greater engagement with the CCCM in a, in a more uh, informally formal or formally informal way. Um, and using the roadmap for research to improve shelter and settlements programming, you probably heard about that uh, earlier. Um, it's something that we supported uh, through the Interaction uh, Shelter and Settlements Working Group. Uh, John Twig and Lizzie Bavister um, were the co-editors for this work that was just issued. I think there are 18 chapters, um, really pretty provocative uh, um, um, papers on uh, trying to map out um, where we need to go in terms of uh, improved programming. IEC and the improvement of shelter and settlements uh, technical assistance. Um, we supported uh, IOM in this. I think Boshra uh, um, had an earlier session on this um, that I, I uh, probably uh, was well described. Um, this is very, very important. I, as a donor, get really tired of, of going to disaster uh, responses and everyone going, well, what do we do? What, where's our information? Where's our, where's our resource? Let's have a common resource. Let's, Let's do the IEC well. Um, a growing uh, shelter and settlements working group under the leadership of, of Interaction, uh, Mohammed Hilmi, who will be in one of the later sessions, um, has been the spearhead of that. Uh, one of the great um, uh, pieces of work uh, really built on uh, that economic uh, rationale that I mentioned earlier um, was the wider impacts of, of shelter and settlements assistance that the Shelter and Settlements Working Group issued uh, a year or so ago. Um, very interesting research and something that strengthens the argument for shelter and settlements investments. It's something that we'd need to do along with increasing um, the, the quality and the visibility of some of the issues related to the very, very low percentage of coverage in the, in the sector. Uh, the power of diaspora, um, we funded, and I think Roberto Romano uh, will be talking about uh, this or maybe has already, power of diaspora communities. Uh, we have thousands in the United States and I'm sure in, in your countries you have uh, uh, groups as well. Uh, they're terribly underutilized and, and, and rarely accessed. And we've had a three-year project with IOM here in the U.S. to try to identify and uh, improve the engagement of diaspora, uh, not just during the post-disaster period, the post-crisis period, but as a matter of, of investment in DRR, disaster risk reduction, um, so that when that money goes home to the home country and investments are made in the home, um, let's make sure that they're done safely and well um, so that uh, when, the, when the next earthquake hits or the next hurricane hits, maybe those impacts will be less. The Shelter Projects publication, uh, we've been involved in uh, the Global Shelter Cluster activity for several years now. Um, we continue to do so. Um, we feel this is a, a, a major means of, of awareness raising in uh, uh, education, public education. Um, we have uh, uh, encouraged, strongly encouraged uh, the Global Shelter Cluster to reach out and expand the network uh, of workshops and uh, um, online 
online uh, activities related to the shelter projects publication. This is something that needs to get literally and figuratively in the hands of decision makers in the countries that we work in so that they have a much better understanding and appreciation of the kind of work that we as the international community provide with regard to sheltered settlements, kind of important. And again, promotion of the settlements approach. This is going forward. I think this will be one of the linchpins of some of the work that we hope to to promote in the, in the sense that um, um, everyone lives in a human settlement. Um, we need to be focused on settlements. Um, we, we, you know, our sector is called shelter and settlements. Um, it's very, very important that we uh, uh, clarify thinking and terminology um, so that we have a, a better way forward. So uh, thank you for your time. Uh, and I hope I can give back a couple of minutes, but uh, if there are any questions, that would be terrific. Thanks very much, Chuck. And, and we're delighted to hear that you would like to have greater engagement with CCCM. Indeed, we think that there's a lot of um, very relevant things that we do. Uh, and Roberta's presentation is coming up in the next block, and she's going to be introducing the framework for diaspora engagement. And she has done some kind of consultations with CCTM as well. So it's, it's interesting to see how you've sparked off that engagement um, around diaspora um, from your work in Haiti. And I remember the presentation that you did um, several years ago at the, at the Cluster Retreat that kind of got us all thinking about how we could um, utilize that expertise much better. So thank you for the update. Um, I see a couple questions here in the chat, um, and one coming um, to to us from Omar, um, asking what you think about adding a firefighting tool to each of the shelters, to each shelter upon contraction. So I'm not sure that I understand the the comment exactly. Um, but that's uh, maybe something that that Omar, we can we can ask the the presenters to kind of comment on on the side. And if there's any other questions to Chuck um, about the ways in which BHA is looking forward and wanting to improve and engage more with CCM. Yeah, I will start off. Um with uh, a response, uh, Jennifer, to, to that particular uh, issue of an Anna, and I overheard some of the issues earlier with, with regard to fire. And obviously that's, that's, that's a major issue. Um, we were talking the other day um, uh, internally about this. Um, I had, the, I guess, in retrospect, the good fortune years ago of growing up in California and, and going uh, as an undergrad on a research project um, with professors who coined the term urban wildland interface uh, and, and looking at these issues from a, a settlements perspective, a, almost a regional planning perspective, um, very strong environmental focus um, to try to figure out where, where um, uh, development um, could uh, be uh, least impactful and least vulnerable to fire risk. Um, I think we, we need to uh, bring those types of principles into the kinds of work that we do when we talk about settlements approach and settlements planning. Um, those are the very, very same things that we talk about. So I, it, it, these are not indistinguishable. I think, you know, I, years ago, my, my professors, and I'm sure your professors did as well, they hammered into the idea that things like uh, fire risk, environmental issues, um, um, environmental management issues, hazard mitigation, diversity, equity, inclusion, that was called good planning, good programming. It's not a one-off, it's not something that's exotic. It should be a core feature of some of the work that we do. Yes, absolutely. And I think that that's one thing that as CCTM is a cross-cutting sector, that we that we do that, um, that we really think about, okay, this is not, um, something that we can just leave to those specialists. We're going to be the ones there day in, day out, and need to make sure that there is quality programming and um, that that's something that's kind of owned by all of us as well. So um, thank you for encouraging us that way. Um, I see a, a question here from Cecilia related to plastic sheeting. 
Um, I'm not sure Correct. if you're able to see the, the chat. Chuck, I shall I read it out for yeah. you? Okay, then go ahead. No, it's fine. Uh, Cecilia, good, good comment. Uh, most of the major uh, providers of, of tarpaulin, and, and certainly uh, it would include us, um, have uh, fire resistant um, um, criteria in their specs. Um, most of the locally purchased uh, plastic sheeting does not. Um, and that's a, just a generalization, but that's, uh, I think that's typically very true. Um, we, you know, it, it, it takes, we, we've actually done a lot of testing on our plastic sheeting and it takes a lot. I will tell you, it, it takes a lot to, to get that to burn. Um, it, it takes a very, very long time for it to catch fire and to remain on fire. So it is very, very fire resistant. Um, it's not fireproof. Um, none of the tarpaulin is fireproof. And that's a distinction that I think we should be aware of as well. Um, and we, we favor the use uh, and we ask for, as a part of our proposal guidelines for confirmation that the specifications of the tarpaulin being used, proposed, meets the basic guidelines and, and, and uh, specifications of the kind of core uh, plastic sheeting providers, uh, the IFRC, UNHCR, IOM, uh, uh, USAID, uh, BHA. So yes, um, this is going to be um, something that it, it, we had a discussion about this with IOM just last week on a friendly proposal. It's kind of important to have decent sheeting that's not gonna catch fire over. Um, another one, Jennifer, should I respond to that as well? <laughs> Yeah, Chuck, why don't you go ahead and take that last one and then we'll get um, Alex to set up his, his presentation. So okay, I think good. it's a great question and, and we'd love to hear from you on it. Sure. I understand that there's discussion of changing spec of tarps to make it more environmentally friendly. Um, oops, uh, we had another one here. Uh, will this impact the quality of shelter? Uh, uh, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, we... Um, as you know, uh, I've been in, involved in conversations with the uh, Global Shelter Cluster Working Group on this uh, activity. Um, we have changed and are changing all of the packaging of all of our NFIs. Um, uh, that includes the, 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 whole, the handling and packaging of, of some of our plastic sheeting. We are going uh, a further level to think that um, can we develop uh, two things? Can we develop plastic sheeting that has a higher content of recycled plastics in it? Can we contribute to uh, the improvement of local markets that uh, collect uh, and scavenger markets that collect uh, plastic? Can we incorporate that into the production of plastic sheeting on the one hand? And on the other hand, can we develop plastic sheeting that will have essentially, uh, that will be biodegradable? Um, and some research that we're doing on that. Um, so is, is there a is there a, a time frame? Uh, you know, would it be a ten year time frame when plastic sheeting starts to degrade? Um, um, we haven't really decided yet, and we really want to see what the state of the art is. So we're working with some of the universities in the U.S. to try to get a better sense of that. Over. Thanks, Chuck. Um, indeed, I'm sure there's going to be uh, continued questions on um, topics that you are more than welcome to weigh in on in the chat here. And we thank you very much for giving us your update on BHA. And with that, let's have you stop sharing and we'll get Alex. Thanks a lot. Thank you very, very much.